Good day, friends. As usual, we'll start with a prayer. What is the topic for today? Is something interesting. Interesting in the sense that the mother is calling the child to now deliver, to come out in the world, and the child refuses to listen. Now, in such a situation, what should the obstetrician do? It has created lots of dilemma. And the obstetrician is always scratching his head. And these dilemmas in management of post date pregnancy is the theme of today's discussion. I will first strike at the very basic and that is definition and clarify your dilemma as regards the definitions are concerned. There are three terminologies which are used. Post date pregnancy. Now post date pregnancy is a pregnancy that has gone beyond due date. Not beyond 42 weeks, beyond due date. Post term pregnancy is a pregnancy that has gone beyond 42 completed weeks of gestation. Whereas post mature is a diagnosis in retrospect, like the diagnosis of normal labor. It is a diagnosis in retrospect where you label a pregnancy after examining the features of post maturity. If they are present on the newborn, you call it as post mature. So these all three are different post date, post term, and post mature. Now, when you want to do label a pregnancy as post date, you would need an accurate dating, as accurate as an arrow hitting the target. And you require tools for this. Now, hitting the target of dating a pregnancy has been found to be the biggest dilemma as regards the approach to post date pregnancy is concerned. None of the methods studied have confidently predicted gestational age except one. So many methods have been studied. Last menstrual period, clinicians non-structured assessment before delivery, Ballard score, foot length, muscularity of the anterior lens, studied postpartum of course, have all been studied but only the ultrasound in early pregnancy, as early as possible, is the most reliable method and solution to the dilemma of dating a post-date pregnancy. Now, can you predict? I'm not talking of predictions based on associated conditions like obesity can be pregnant, the diabetes uh, improperly managed or improperly controlled can lead to post-date pregnancy. All this is known. No. Can you, irrespective of these dilemmas, sorry, sorry, irrespective of these uh, collateral conditions, predict that this pregnancy is likely to go in for post-date Recent studies have shown that yes, you can. And in this, ultrasound can help us. A little older study, around four years or so, and that has used sonography to tell that if at 20 to 24 weeks scan, the cervical length is more than four centimeters, then such mothers are likely to end up in post-date pregnancies more significantly than others. Are any chemical tests helpful in this? One or two studies have come, reliable studies, and they are where a ratio of SFLT1 to PIGF, where an anti-angiogenic pre-delivery profile is worked out. And from there, the blood ratio, people are able to predict a post-date pregnancy as early as around 20 weeks. These placenta have been found to have increased in CTL knotting and fibrin, which were said to be responsible for this biochemical manifestation. Now, once you have defined, once you have predicted, now you would like 
to go to an area which is of real concern. Once the pregnancy crosses the due date, the obstetrician is worried about the fetal well-being the most. And is there any way by which we can reliably, with the help of modern science, monitor the fetal well-being of a post-date pregnancy? And in this, the Doppler cerebroplacental ratio shows the highest diagnostic accuracy as early as April 20, 2022 study has shown that this is the most reliable method to predict and to tell that this baby inside is still well. A CPR of more than one is very reliable. Now the question comes in the mind of obstetrician, which you all must be facing, that can we wait before inducing? But are there any advantages of inducing over expected? Why not let it uh, go on, the pregnancy go on? Well, the management of post-term pregnancy constitutes a challenge to the clinicians in the fact that which patient mother to induce and who will re respond to your induction or who will require a caesarean section is something which has been bugging us for not, not less than a decade. And some solutions have come out. The emerging evidence demonstrates that the incidence of complications associated with post-term pregnancy increases even prior to 42 weeks. So you might say that wait till 42, even prior to 40. For example, I'll give you the example. The stillbirth rate increases from 39 weeks onwards with a sharp rise after 40 weeks. So 39, you please remember, I know for the last 15 years now, 39 has been uh, doing rounds and it has been accepted as a very important landmark, not no more 40. But after 40, there's a sharp rise in stillbirths. What about waiting for labor or induced labor? Compared to the policy of expectant management, a policy of labor induction was associated with fewer perinatal deaths attributable to all causes. So induction, less perinatal deaths. There were four perinatal deaths in labor induction policies and 25, 6.25 times more deaths in expectant management group. And this is a high certainty evidence as regards the quality of this evidence is concerned. I will go still further. 2020 Cochrane data shows that there were fewer stillbirths in the induction group. All these are 39 and beyond. Two in the induction group and 16 in the expectant management group. So therefore, for women in the policy of induction group, there were fewer cesarean section. Please, this is what I would like to stress. There is a common belief in the layman, in the laity, that you will induce labor and land up in cesarean section. No. In fact, there are fewer in cesarean sections in the induction group compared with the expectant management. There was no difference in operative vaginal births with induction. So where are you losing? Nowhere. Induction makes no difference to PPH because there was a theory in between the uterus is not ready and you forcibly or hastily make it ready. This is all nonsense. The rates of NICU admission were actually lower in induction group. I again repeat, beyond 37 weeks, not even 39, beyond 37 is all favorable. Fewer babies had Abgar scores less than seven at five minutes in the induction group. There was a clear reduction in perinatal deaths with a policy of labor induction at or before beyond 37. One, lower cesarean rates without increasing the rates of operative vaginal births and there were fewer NICU admissions. 
most of these important outcomes were assessed using the high quality grade valuation systems and therefore had a very high certainty ratings. Then why wait after 37? But in case, never beyond 39. So solution to this dilemma is induction after 37 is safe and better. 39 weeks should be the accepted cutoff now. It applies also for post-term pregnancy. If you get a pregnancy post-term first time, then induce. Now how best to induce? This in itself is a full lecture. I would not like to go into this, but here something new has come, which I would like to share. My lectures <coughs> and discussions which I put on my YouTube channel are essentially those where something new has come or certain doubts are there which require to be clarified and therefore a teacher like me is expected to clarify them. So, without going into the full lecture of how best to induce something new which has come on the horizon and that is this hygroscopic dilators. They are called dilapan, recently induced, relatively recently induced and these are FDA cleared mechanical cervical dilators designed for a gentle predictable cervical ripening in the induction of labor. I am not touching follies, I am not touching uh, 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 misoprostol or anything so, or cerviprim gel or whatever, only because these are all established and we are not going into that. And as I told you, in itself is a full lecture. But this is a non-pharmacologic substance, allows freedom of movement and even comfortable enough to be for the mother to sleep through. Dilapan is 2018 has proved is acceptable and safe form of induction. No case of hyperstimulation was found and therefore it may be a suitable option even for outpatient induction. However, there are some complaints regarding the dilapan being thrown out or just getting dislodged and falling out. But that these are still very small in amount and more data will be required to take a stand. However, as of now, this looks to be a new promise. We come to the last part of this short lecture and that is dilemmas and solutions, special situations. What are the special situations? Obesity is one special situation which has come up. Since 1971, we as medical practitioners are facing obesity in a big way. When a 2022 May-June study, quite recent, not even six months old, had two subjects divided into BMI, uh, based on BMI, with BMI less than 25 and more than 25, it was found that, they, and these patients were prospectively followed, it was found that subjects with higher pre-pregnancy BMI is associated with increased risk of post date pregnancy. So now it goes beyond doubt that if you have an obese mother on hand, pregnant mother, be alert from 37, and at 39, induce. This uh, 2018 study shows that based on our study, we conclude that there is a higher risk of seizures also in obese subjects who are undergoing induction of labor. So, induce earlier. That is more important. One more question which I am consistently asked wherever I have given lectures on post datism and that is can we allow a vaginal birth after cesarean section in a subject who has a previous cesarean uh, section and a post date pregnancy. Yes, you can. There is no difference in that post date pregnancies can deliver successfully by VBAC in greater than 60% or 65% subjects. So, all those criteria which you use for, for a, a VBAC, same are to be used for post date in selection of the subject for VBAC. Last, a very short mention that secondary abdominal pregnancies are known to go in for post datism. 
So friends, to sum up, big confusion. This post datism, when to induce, if to induce, will there be any problems? What is wrong in keeping? I have tried to answer all of these, keeping most of the times latest evidence in mind. Because our science has evolved so much, we are able to get many new lights and solutions to our problems vis-a-vis -vis post date pregnancy management is concerned. Now there are no confusions. I feel till a new confusion is created, there are no confusion. Picture is very clear. 37 onwards induce and monitor with a CPR, cerebral placental ratio. At 20 weeks, you can predict and the definitions are also clear. So that's a one sentence summary. All these efforts are for our incessant service to humanity and mankind. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much.